Trump. Welcome to the virtual launch of OCHA's report from Digital Promise to Frontline Practice, which discusses the challenges and opportunities of new and emerging technologies in humanitarian action. My name is Yuping Chan. I am from the Office of the Secretary General's Envoy on Technology here at the United Nations, and I've been extremely honored to have been asked by OCHA to help moderate today's session, which features an extinct, extremely distinguished lineup of speakers. After a first round of remarks from our speakers, there will then be a further question and answer session with our speakers. We also encourage attendees and participants joining us who may have any questions or comments to enter those into the question and answer. Please feel free to interact via the chat, but we will be looking at the question and answer section for the questions to our speakers themselves. So we'll start today's launch event with um, our first speaker. That is the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and the United Nations Emergency Relief Coordinator, Under Secretary General Mark Lokok uh, from the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. Under Secretary General, please. Thank you very much indeed, Yu Ping. And hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us uh, today. And let me just start by um, thanking and congratulating my colleagues again on the uh, report that we're um making available to everybody today which I, i'm sure if you read it you'll find it's full of valuable insights and useful things you can actually do something about um, i do think that new and emerging technologies really can help transform the way humanitarian agencies work especially in enabling us to anticipate and get ahead of more problems rather than simply reacting um all the time i think tools like um predictive analytics which we've used a lot um in in deciding when to release resources from the un central emergency response fund things like um the the um use you can make of artificial intelligence um capabilities can help us for example analyze humanitarian data sets much much faster than we can any human being can do and therefore enable us to act faster and in a better informed way. I also think technologies can help us do something I think is really important and that I've been talking about a bit recently, which is listen more to people caught up in crises and do more of the things they want us to do. Technology can help us listen to them through things like, you know, social media and chat box and mobile apps and doing more of the things that they want us to do, for example, through the use of um, digital cash is um, in a much bigger way than it's being used at the moment is something that technology enables now. Obviously, we have to think about the challenges and risks about um, technology in humanitarian context. We need to look after data carefully. Um, we need to be aware of who is connected and who isn't. Uh, we need to be aware of the risk of malign actors um, misusing information and um, be careful to be aware of who um, we may not have complete data about and which may be disadvantaging um, to them. At um, In my office, at the Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, we've been involved in various efforts to try to unlock digital technologies for humanitarian agencies they um all all everything we've been doing has been framed under the secretary general's roadmap for digital cooperation and actually i think that my office has some important tools and capabilities in the digital space websites like relief web for example which has been providing access to information from thousands of humanitarian agencies for 25 years is visited more than a million times a month um, we've also collaborated with the Kingdom of the Netherlands. The Secretary General and I launched the Centre for Humanitarian Data in my office in The Hague in late 2017. I'm thrilled we have Bikita with us um, today. And it's growing fast um, in terms of its um, the uptake of its uh, resources, the centre. Um, more than a million visitors, more than two million data sets um, downloaded last year um in terms of the study that we're making available today and talking about today the writers uh, um, and analysts who did it for us talked to a lot of humanitarian and technology experts um humanitarian agencies 
I think, have a really important role to play in helping us bridge the digital divide and empower people caught up in crisis, um, in trying to make sure we do more things, as I said earlier, that people caught in crisis actually want us to do, their priorities get responded to, in other words, um, and um, in ensuring um, that we have appropriate technical skills and capacity in our own organisation um, and that we invest in um, in a, in a far-sighted long-term way to um, ensure that we um, harvest the gains available from technology. So I think there's a lot of useful and valuable material in the report. It's a collaborative um, effort that's produced it and I'm grateful for the opportunity to uh, discuss it with you all here today and looking forward to what everyone has to say. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, and the Secretary General. And indeed, as you mentioned, the Secretary General's roadmap for digital cooperation, which is the United Nations vision for a more open, free, and secure future, really calls on UN agencies to better harness digital technologies in fulfilling their mandates. And OCHA, the humanitarian actors in the system, are at the vanguard of, as you say, unlocking digital technologies for this. We now turn to our next speaker, Ms. Brigitta Tazela, who is the Deputy Director General for International Cooperation at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Brigitte, please. Thank you, Niu Ping. And uh, it's so, so wonderful to be here, to be here also with Mark Lowcock, who's such a fantastic leader on this uh, topic. So thank you very much, Mark, for that. Um, well, we attach, I want to set the scene a little bit, and then I'll come to the report and to uh, how we look at things uh, beyond here. Uh, we attach a great importance uh, to working on digitalization uh, and working with data uh, in the humanitarian world, but also beyond, uh, also beyond that. And this is reflected in a, in a Dutch uh, digital agenda. Uh, which aims to uh, to reach our, our policy uh, goals through capitalizing on the benefits of digitalization more efficiently and effectively. And um, well, we know all we are facing increasing humanitarian needs uh, due to, amongst others, whether it's climate change or protected conflict. And we really feel that digital technology, technological opportunities are really vital in enabling earlier, faster and more effective humanitarian action. So the Netherlands, as well as other donors, are providing high amounts of flexible uh, financing, meaning unearmarked funding for humanitarian assistance. But for that, really, it's so important to have accurate data throughout the humanitarian program cycle. This is really essential to make the best use of these resources. Um, and that uh, accuracy of data uh, is also necessary for other donors to be convinced to start um, uh, financing flexible. Uh, the more transparency, the more visualization, uh, the, the higher uh, willingness of other donors also to come on board when it comes to quality financing. So we're convinced that data are, uh, is also important to help advance the humanitarian objectives to save lives. Uh, accurate data needs to feed into decision making processes at all level uh, at all levels, uh, whether it's about the scale and prediction of needs, uh, funding requirements, funding levels or allocation decisions. And this requires data sharing, standardization, uh, responsible use of data, of course, skilled analysis of data and trusted data models. And we really believe that considerable progress was made in recent years. Uh, about the greater use uh, of data and humanitarian assistance. And we really, we continue to be committed to championing digitalization through our support of the OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data, CHD, as well as supporting projects such as CAN Tool 2.0 and uh, 510. Uh, Probably others will speak about that later. And we're really pleased to see also the value of work of the data center, such as the state of open humanitarian data reports and the increase in data exchange through humanitarian data exchange. The, the guideline on responsible data use and the predictive analytics work around the pandemic. The work has implications for the broader humanitarian community, for example, uh, proving it is possible to use historical data sets from one country or region to predict humanitarian needs elsewhere during the development of the pilot in Somalia in 2018, for example. So I really would like to express my appreciation for the hard work of OCHA and the research team in creating this comprehensive report, which includes 
a vast range of uh, different technologies ranging from AI to blockchain, chat box, 3D printing. Uh, it highlights the opportunities as well as the risks involved in enabling digitalization and technology in the humanitarian sector, as Mark mentioned as well, um, including, of course, the risk of leaving people behind as a result of the digital, digital divide. Of course, this digitalization and data are not a panacea to, panacea to everything, but it offers new opportunities to better assist people in need uh, if we follow the do no harm principle when working digitally, especially with sensitive data. And we can learn from best practices across the humanitarian sector. For example, the responsible use of sensitive data by the Archer Data Center and WFP during the Ebola crisis in West Africa. The report really provides much needed tools that help navigate digitalization in the humanitarian sector, identifying risks which include exacerbating existing gender bias and inequalities. And in the end, this report on technological opportunities and risks helps the humanitarian sector identify how to use technological adva advances to enable better assistance for affected people in need, which is our ultimate goal. So we're pleased to see the network that the OCHA Data Center has built, its innovative partnerships and the number of other donors now supporting the center. And we, will, we really look forward to, uh, to work on the second phase, integrating predictive, uh, predictive, predictive yes, analyt analytics into existing humanitarian decision-making processes. And, and this will continue to enable faster and more effective humanitarian action. Um, again, I'm looking forward to what others uh, say, are saying and to the panel discussion. Thank you very much, Yuping. Thank you so much, Brigitte. And really, the Netherlands has been a leader and a forerunner in the area of digital technologies and data. And we at the United Nations are also very grateful for the support that you have provided both to the UN system's work in this area and as on your emphasis on quality financing as well. So thank you again. We now turn to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Ms. Sandra Uwatega Hart, who is joining us from Vanuatu, where it's 2 a.m. So thank you so much, Sandra, for taking the time to be with us and staying up so late to share your perspectives. Sandra is the co-founder and chief humanitarian officer of Emerging Impact, which builds bridges to translate, connect, and adapt big technology to and for the humanitarian sector, civil society, and communities on the ground. Sandra, please. All right, thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, I come from over a decade of work in the humanitarian space, uh, and in particular, Emerging Impact works on really this in between space, helping to connect humanitarian organizations to um, use cases and applications of blockchain technology in emerging economies specifically, um, with a focus on the global south. Um, some people in the room might also know that I am also, you know, have been the leader of the Unblock Cash project at Oxfam, which, believe it or not, in the remote island nation of Vanuatu, there is the region's largest humanitarian operation being delivered using blockchain technology. Um, but some key points around emerging impact are that this company has been formed by leaders from, you know, social impact in blockchain from the humanitarian space, because what we've noticed is that as much as humanitarian agencies have that connection to communities on the ground, have significant global reach in a way that the tech sector does not, particularly across emerging markets, the humanitarian sector also needs help in terms of technical assistance, technical support, uh, and learning to internalize, you know, and build these new skill sets around how these digital technologies and applications can be built for our purposes in the humanitarian sector, but most importantly, that um, you know, these technologies now we have this opportunity to engage with communities in that product development process to really try to craft co iterative approaches that allow communities a voice, a voice to really codify, you know, their preferences, their perspectives, um, and their perception of what works and what is appropriate in humanitarian assistance into these applications on the ground. Um, so we work very closely on objectives related to enhancing diversity in the technology space as a minority founded company, um, but recognizing that in culture, in ethnicity, gender, age, disability, income, and the multitude of these perspectives that we have 
in the global south, you know, all of these things can only enrich the innovation process. Um, and the key thing is to try and capture the vision of who, who this user is on the ground that the humanitarian agency engages with and who the tech works with um, and works for. So we also focus very, very closely on a bottom-up approach. So this question of localization through humanitarian action being enabled by digital technology and specifically being able by, enabled by decentralized infrastructure, which is what blockchain is. So using a decentralized and distributed infrastructure to provide a lightweight option to not just decentralized delivery, but also decentralized control and power in the humanitarian delivery process. And so we really seek to help tech companies build applications that are to minimum humanitarian standards, but that also are able to become more robust through a stress testing process that local communities can engage in. Um, so that's where I'm coming from. I'll be speaking mainly to the localization side and mainly to the practical side of as much as there is a digital promise, you know, the areas that I work in are focused on that frontline practice, which is complex, um, but can also be greatly simplified, you know, through the types of digital technologies that we have today and particularly blockchain. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. And in fact, that frontline practice is the frontline perspective that we really so desperately need, because as you said, it really is about reminding us who it is that the technology serves and who we ultimately serve as well. So thank you so much for that. We now turn to our next speaker who is um, John Frank. Mr. John Frank is the Vice President for UN Affairs at Microsoft. John, please. Thank you very much for the invitation to be part of this event and congratulations to Ocha for, for producing a, a very thoughtful report that um, goes into a new area. It's sort of addressing what are opportunities, but also what are the uh, social issues um, that need to be thought about as you develop um, applications with these new te technologies. Um, there's an incredibly exciting time right now, just from the IT industry. We're, we're, we, we predict that the percentage of our economy is going to go from 5% to 10% that's going to be information technology related. Um, there are so many innovations taking place on the foundation of advances in data science, um, the advances of cloud computing, which means you don't have to build a data center. Uh, you don't need supercomputers in your office to be able to tap into incredibly vast amounts of computation power. And then add that with inexpensive sensors, whether they're digital cameras, um, you know, drones, um, you know, a whole range of, of ways to gather data much more efficiently and expensively and in real time, it greatly increases the capacity for, for new solutions. Um, the, um, I think that's an incredibly important point though, it's sort of like, we're a technology company. We, we have, we've got a core team of people that work in a humanitarian projects office and you know, Cameron Berge, uh, Jane Messick, great people. And they've been engaged with the community to understand, but we don't, we don't know your mission. Um, we know technology. And so the partnerships that we have to form, um, you know, we need to be learning from you. Um, we just can't show up with, hey, we've got a great idea. You know, no, it's like, we've got great technology. Can we have a conversation more about what your needs are? Um, you know, when the uh, pandemic began, um, Dr. Boutros at uh, WHO called our CEO and said, I need help. Um, and, you know, the, the response was, well, how can we help? And so we sat down and we had a bunch of our best computer data scientists meet with the WHO team to understand what they needed. And out of that came about 18 different projects uh, that were going to be scoped and developed. Some of those projects were discarded because it wasn't really uh, an IT issue that we, you know, that, that could easily be successfully addressed. 
but others were. And so um, from small tactical issues to rebuilding their website to handle global volume to creating a data science hub where all of WHO data can be put and analyzed in a data lake, uh, you know, sort of those kind of projects are um, response to what WHO said that, that would be most useful for them and the dialogue that we had about it. So I think that understanding that we don't come with a great deal of insights about your business uh, and your mission, we share your commitment though, uh, and we want to be helpful. Um, you know, in addition to some of the aspects in the paper that talk about, if you will, the, you know, kind of the privacy security kind of issues that need to be managed. I just want to highlight that there's, it's not just a closed system that you get to manage with IT projects. Um, you know, sometimes users do things with our products that weren't intended. Uh, and technology companies sometimes create products with the hopes they'll be used well, but find out that they're being used for bad things. Technology companies need to own the bad uses that their customers make of products as well. And we need to make sure that our products are being used for good. Uh, but part of that too is recognizing that there can be external actors. Um, you know, we've seen an incredible rise in cybersecurity attacks against hospitals and medical um, institutions over this past year. And, and so I think we, you know, we need to think about how do we create rules of the road that prevent nation state actors from interfering in these projects um, in ways that I think all, most all, everybody else would agree uh, are not helpful. So I think it's, it's an incredibly important topic of this paper. I think it's really exciting to, to, to learn more about the uh, predictive analytics and how those are being applied. Um, there's really great opportunities um, to help the mission um, of humanitarian action. Um, and so um, congratulations on the paper and uh, we look forward to working with you. Thank you so much, John. And I think it's a sign of Microsoft's commitment to working with the United Nations that my, the, Microsoft was the first company to actually have a UN Affairs Office right here in New York, precisely so that you could learn a little bit more about the UN and see how we could work, better work together through partnerships. So thank you again for Microsoft's commitment to the United Nations and to supporting the world of OCHA and the humanitarian agencies and digital cooperation more broadly. Um, we now turn to our next speaker, who is Ms. Cindy Isaac, the Deputy Head of Office in Somalia for the United Nations Office of Coordination and Humanitarian Affairs. Cindy, again, I think is adding to that perspective of frontline practice, turning what we talk about into real action. Cindy, please. Thank you very much, Yu Ping. And uh, I have to say, I'm, I'm very honored to be part of such a distinguished uh, group of panelists. So thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. Um, I, I would like to start with um, just a, a personal example of, of one of my first experiences using um, or uh, understanding technology and technology transfer. Um, in, 2000, in 2000, I was on a field mission in a very remote and I have to say quite desolate uh, Somali refugee camp in Yemen. I was touring the camp and my uh, Canadian uh, camp manager at the time asked if we could go to the market within the camp itself so that he could transfer money. And I, I was like, transfer money? What about the Western Union in Annan? And he laughed at me and he said, oh, God, no, that will take for weeks. Um, with the Somalis, I can get cash directly the same day to and from Canada. And uh, I tell that story because this is one of my first experiences into the Hawala uh, money network system that has shaped Somalis and, and Somalia as, frankly, a leader when it comes to money transfer, even to this day. Um, you look at you look at that system of, of trust based uh, money exchange, which is now turned into uh, you know a vast money transfer mechanism, um, to which we use as humanitarians, in in, in which uh, a cash based assistance is actually proportionally the highest form of assistance provided within Somalia, and then you also look at the whole. Um, remittances and a significant portion of, of how that mobile transfer, the Hawala network, has 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 been used to support millions of Somalis. Um, and in my own experience uh, working in a number of countries, 
there are extraordinary examples of uh, such as this one where technology and innovation has been transformative uh, from the beginning, but then also over time. Um, however, there are also cautionary examples of where it has failed. And um, as we move more into a digital age, there are significant pro protection related concerns um, for those very same populations that we're trying to serve. Um, I would like to start with um, uh, highlighting where technology has been invaluable. Um, and this is what's been great about the report is that there is this focus on the more advanced forms of technology, such as AI, blockchains, drones, while frankly speaking, some of the most uh, direct gains that have been made are through the most basic uses of technology and their wide uptake among the population. Um, for example, um, the increased use of cell phones by beneficiaries and the provision of adequate network coverage has been incredibly important as evidence as we see through the uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. And this has been crucial when we look at accountability to affected populations, assessments, cash transfers and monitoring. Um, open data and data sharing platforms have also been invaluable. Some key examples include OTK, COPO uh, data collection tools, which have both not only online, but frankly, sometimes more importantly, offline functionalities. Uh, for example, ODK briefcase allows for structured data collection to occur in location with an internet connection. Also, when we look at um, the overall registration of beneficiaries, um, you know, uh, systems like the WFP biometric scope registration has allowed for approved targeting and monitoring of, ass of assistance. Um, I also want to highlight WFP because, you know, with the whole COVID um, uh, pandemic, they introduced a mobile money option for cash delivery to beneficiaries. This has provided a con uh, contactless method of transfer whereby beneficiaries receive their entitlements through, through SIM cards, avoiding gathering of distributions, mitigating the risk of transmission, as well, uh, very importantly, providing additional protection benefits to beneficiaries. And building on this, WFP will also be testing biometric authentication through voice verification instead of fingerprints, allowing beneficiaries to authenticate their identity through their phones. Um, and I use this as an example, is, is it um, an evolution of technology that's been used in country and to support the gaps that, that exist. Um, but this is also where I want to highlight some concerns. Um, Technological solutions are often falsely, possessed, um, falsely predicated as simple fixes to complex coordination issues. Um, this relies on, this, on the problematic assumption that if only the technology were better, uh, we would all use it to its full potential. The reality is, is that often we have, um, we have va a vast array of advanced technology available to us but face the prosaic day-to-day -day coordination issues and frankly, the mandate-driven tensions that inhibit the use of those technologies. And it really is these human issues that need to be resolved in tandem with the introduction of new systems and technology. Um, for innovation to occur in a meaningful way, new technologies need to be carefully embedded within the existing coordination frameworks. Um, this is also with regard to the whole issue around lack of sharing of innovative technologies, which, which lead um, in, in many times to constant, what I would say is reinvention of the wheel across actors and responses globally. Um, there's also the whole issue around data security and then the really the huge importance of information sharing protocols. Um, really, there does need to be a balance um, between uh, adequate data sensitivity and security protocols while allowing for sufficient information sharing across agencies and organizations. Uh, and along these lines, uh, certain forms of data collection need to be closely monitored and frankly, potentially stopped. For example, the farming of personal phone numbers through the use of private uh, partnerships with telecom providers um, is sometimes done without beneficiary consent. Um, also, when we look at the private sector and what the private sector can offer in terms of advanced data driven ways of working and technologies that could be used, um, this is extremely important. But, but when we look at overall involvement, we do need to be careful um, 
uh, to ensure that that it, it works within and is vetted and monitored within the humanitarian ecosystem. Um, and frankly, there's very little capacity for this to occur, particularly at the field level. So um, it would be great to look at how we can better leverage potential private public partnerships, both at the local and global level, knowing that this is extremely important. Um, uh, and along these lines, uh, just to highlight some of the, the extraordinary work that's been done, particularly around cash based assistance. Um, and then um, I want to also highlight uh, three points around where technology may not be applicable. Um, firstly, many vulnerable populations don't necessarily want to be found, registered, or monitored. So this whole issue around the right to remain anonymous is the broader ethical question that, that raises concerns throughout the, the use of a wide range of technologies. Um, there's also the issue of appropriateness of certain technologies. Um, for example, the use of drones. Um, in Somalia, uh, drones have been used uh, in, in an extraordinary way, for example, to look at the impact of floods. However, within the same context, um, the use of drones in other areas of Somalia would be extremely problematic because of the way drones are viewed and used um, in terms of being a weapon of war. Um, moving beyond Somalia, um, uh, the example of of uh, children in Jordan and, and Syria who are terrified of the drones because and for the simple for the fact that these drones were actually only being used for uh, camping map exercises, but again, it's the connotation and the the uh, reality of, of, of understanding where and when these technologies are appropriate. Um, lastly, um, the use of mobile phones can also be highly problematic uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, when we look at overall cultural sensitivity um, and context, for example, in some, some conflicts, calling a woman directly or calling anyone within uh, ISIS or in the case of Somalia, Al Shabaab. Uh, control territories is an immediate protection concern. So, in these cases, we do need to also rely on low tech qualitative methods. Um, I'll end there. Um, there's a lot, <laughs> a lot of food for thought, but uh, you know, frankly speaking, it's only really scratches the surface of, of, of where we are and where we want to go. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Cindy. Um, our last speaker, the Assistant Secretary General Maria Francesca Spatolisano, I think is having an urgent commitment right somewhere else and will probably join us a little bit later. So in the meantime, shall we go to our first round of questions for our distinguished speakers? So we've collected a number of questions um, and comments from participants as well as interested constituents. And the first question to the Under Secretary General Lowcock um, is on the issue of the biggest changes that have resulted from the COVID pandemic and what lessons we can learn from the future with regards to using new and emerging technologies in humanitarian action. And the Secretary General, please. Well, I think actually it's gonna take a while to work out what the biggest long-term changes to the pan, uh, arising from the pandemic are. Um, you know, the in the short term, obviously, the huge thing is the enormous contraction um, in the world economy and the effect is the pandemic's had on every single human being's daily life. The, the consequences of the pandemic are worst of all in the most vulnerable, fragile countries. And unfortunately, in those places, particularly where um, people rely on humanitarian assistance, the uh, mitigation of those consequences through technology which have been available to all of us as as people on this call you know we're having this call in the way we've got used to interacting with other people over the last year um, online um, you know i've spent most of the last year um, in my little two-bedroom apartment in manhattan um, often not leaving from one week to the next, but I've been able to do my job in a similar sort of way in many ways as I was able to before the pandemic. And so for people who've got access to um, technology and have incomes, it's been possible to keep going with lots of things. That's not the case for um, people in humanitarian settings. So coming out of the pandemic, there are, firstly, there's huge um, costs that need to be 
um, managed and there's a huge recovery challenge which needs to start with getting everybody on the planet vaccinated which the world is tragically a long way from having a credible plan to do um, but there are also some opportunities and one of the things in humanitarian agencies we need to do is work out um, particularly in the technology space what has been learned in the last year that we can use to apply um, bearing in mind all the risks of the sort that um, John and um, um, Cindy in particular have flagged that need to be managed because you know um, technology can be put to good uses but technology can also be put to bad uses and we need to be intelligent about um, our understanding of all the issues if we're going to protect really vulnerable people. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, now let's turn to Brigitte um, with the question from the audience. Why should member states and other donors invest in digitalization? How can donors help ensure digi successful digitalization while avoiding the pitfalls associated with technology solutions in humanitarian context? I think this particularly apt given your emphasis on how you as a donor country have really sought to support this type of work and how perhaps this is really some consideration for you going forward. Mm. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I, I think our assumption is that um, using technology will ensure that we are more efficient and more effective. Uh, but I think it is really important to build evidence that this is actually the case. At the same time, we know there's no way back. Uh, there is uh, only going to be more digitalization instead of less. So we, we, we have to make use of the system in such a way that we uh, will build this evidence that it is that it is actually more effective and efficient, and therefore I'm really really pleased that there are people from the field who can share their 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 knowledge uh, when it comes to that. Uh, of course, also so I think the other reason, uh, as I mentioned before, how important it is to use this. Uh, uh, the, these data, but but I also agree we have to be aware of the risks and um, uh, of course the, the do no harm principle was it, it has to be at the forefront. Uh, I think Mark mentioned it very clearly. It's so important to involve communities, and we we have to continue doing that and not think of technology as Cindy mentioned as a you know this will solve everything and it uh, it will solve difficult coordination processes. It will not. Uh, and and the worst thing we could do is to use uh, data and digitalization while ignoring communities. I mean, it, it should go the other way around, as Sandra mentioned. This is the localization which is so important. So how to use, how to match the two, the localization and the digitalization. And I think we, we have to learn and we have to build evidence and, and, and therefore, and then thereafter we can uh, replicate. But I've been in so many meetings over the last year about this precise, about this issue. And I find it is, still difficult to 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 have a, a real good an, uh, analysis about uh, good practices uh, what can we learn and how can we build on that and i think we're still there is more in the field than it than, than is being collected so it's important to collect that evidence and to uh, and to build on that and also uh, finally Yingping, I would say, um, um, besides involving the communities, um, it's also to have a, uh, important to have a, um, a mechanism for redress. Uh, in case, um, uh, through the use of data, uh, humanitarian aid is given in an unfairly uh, manner. And where can communities go to? And we, we have to find a mechanism for, for redress for that as well. But um, but yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a struggle, but I think we have to get better into um uh into writing down and sharing uh, experience and building evidence on what works and what doesn't work thank you thank you so much particularly for those very action-oriented elements as to what can be done next um we are now joined by assistant secretary general maria francesca spatelisano who is actually the Assistant Secretary General in the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs and the officer in charge of the Office of the Secretary General's Envoy Technology is ESG Spatoli Sano. Um, we are now in the question and answer segment of the program, but perhaps I could introduce the question that has been asked by the audience to you and perhaps you could fold that into your remarks overall as to um, the, the, in, the intersection of digital technologies and humanitarian. And the question that has been asked to you has been, 
Um, what are some of the different ways in which the Secretary General's roadmap for digital cooperation that we have heard about from other speakers as well is being taken forward? And what are the next steps? And how is the roadmap important to and related to humanitarian action? ASG, please. Yes, thank you, Yuping. And uh, first of all, my apologies uh, for joining so late. I was uh, moderating a panel later conference on SDG 16, and so I had to split myself between my two uh, jobs. But I am really grateful uh, for you to inviting me to, to participate in this launch of the report, because uh, uh, humanitarian uh, uh, has been at the forefront of innovation for so many years. Uh, you pushed by the need and by the creativity of people. You have started working with digital innovation way ahead of others, uh, whether it was digital payment, digital IT, data collection, and so on and so forth. And, and this uh, um, uh, is the, the beneficial side of uh, digital uh, uh, technology. Of course, as I heard others saying, there are also the risks of these uh, new tools we can use. and. Uh, this is uh, why we have to, uh, you know, be careful and, and follow some common principles. And so now the, the duality of these digital technologies lies at the heart of the Secretary General Roadmap for Digital Cooperation. The technology is a tool, as I was saying, and also is a, a transformative uh, uh, element for our societies. So, so we, with this report, we can actually better understand how this transformative impact uh, uh, operates in humanitarian space and how we can better steer and govern the technologies to ensure the vision of the roadmap, which is a vision of technology, uh, let's say, which uh, produces safer and more equitable future for all. Now, for the details of what we have done in the office of the tech envoy to implement this roadmap so far, uh, I invite you to visit uh, our website, which is uh, uh, newly launched, and you will find there a, an update note on the various uh, uh, elements of implementation we have been able to put in place in the first uh, three months of existence, and also uh, some other initiatives which are related to the world work of the office, like a coalition for digital environmental sustainability and other aspects. So the, the roadmap basically is a, is a vision, is a framework, and uh, it offers uh, uh, to everybody the possibility to con concur in creating uh, the, the new rules of the game for this new tool. Say it is based on a multi-stakeholder approach, of course, this work, and that is very important that we include all the actors. Thank you. Um, our next question from the floor, actually, and this is actually an amalgamation of several questions. I think it's directed to Sandra, particularly given her perspectives on returning sort of the, the focus to the field and local engagement and making humanitarian action more local, which really has been a longstanding commitment by and challenge of the humanitarian space. So there are a number of questions, for instance, from Edward Mele and Lawrence Amphel as to the examples and the context by which certain types of technologies such as blockchain, AI, machine learning has actually been successful and impactful in the field, especially with regards to aspects such as personal health records. So from your experience, Sandra, how have you seen these technologies being deployed locally and what are your thoughts on their use there in these um, areas? All right, thank you. Um, I'll choose to answer particularly around blockchain technology uh, just to begin, although these other technologies that you mentioned, AI and machine learning can, you know, can also function in the same ways. But I think, uh, you know, some of our panelists have referred to this. The key thing that we need to remember in connecting these global technologies too local is that when we are able to is that they give us the chance to automate very complex processes in data analysis in financial management in the administration of humanitarian delivery that provide us the opportunity to lower capacity barriers 
for local organizations to participate in those processes more actively, to deliver more directly and at lower cost, but most importantly, with a level of quality that is commensurate with the level of quality of a multi-million dollar you know, UN agency or international NGO. Um, some of the most specific use cases you know, in this space, particularly using blockchain technology, digital identity is one. Um, it is fraught with benefit, you know, for, for example, stateless populations, um, people who have lost their identity papers, and in particular, in the areas of collaboration with government who struggle to provide a unique identifier to their population for the purposes of simplifying and expediting the delivery of social assistance, but also humanitarian assistance in times of crisis. However, you know, it's a double edged sword, you know, the use of biometrics raises questions around things like GDPR regulations. It raises questions around the level of responsibility of humanitarian agencies in managing people's biometric data. Um, as you know, as 1 of our panelists suggested, some people want to remain anonymous. You know, so we really need to balance the level of responsibility that the advances in technology give us. And part of balancing that level of responsibility is acknowledging that humanitarian agencies do have a leading role to play with the tech industry. You know, as, as you know, our panelists from Microsoft mentioned, we have access to these communities um, and we are able to voice concerns and kind of um, occupy an ethically responsible space, a right-based approach, and make sure that tech companies embed this in the way that they are deploying applications for identity management, for example. Um, but we should also try and get out of our comfort zone as humanitarians to acknowledge that these same technologies are able to do something that we have struggled with. So, for example, providing people the opportunity and the right to maintain to maintain anonymity, to stay anonymous, but still be able to access the delivery of humanitarian assistance in a transparent way, right? So the debate, and for this, getting really outside our comfort zone and looking at the debate on digital currencies, digital assets, and cryptocurrencies, and the way that those mechanisms are essentially a financial service, this is the delivery of cash that can be made possible through those mechanisms. And those mechanisms can also be programmed to provide that right to anonymity, right? The question for me is whether the humanitarian com community and our donors are comfortable with that. Um, I think the biggest use case in blockchain technology right now, um, aside from this data management question, which of course gives us predictable analytics more relevant for machine learning and AI, is in where blockchain started to begin with, you know, which is payments, right? So this question of cryptocurrency, digital currency, and what is now being called decentralized finance. Blockchain provides us with an in infrastructure that we've now seen from WFP, we've seen from Oxfam, we've seen from Mercy Corps, and a multitude of humanitarian organizations globally, but also blockchain companies like Celo, uh, who now are beginning to hone in and specialize on leveraging decentralized finance and the networks and applications it provides to deliver cash transparently at scale in a fully transparent and traceable way to the people who need it most, even in environments that struggle with connectivity. Why? because it allows us to build out this digital last mile that can then interoperate with the devices that people already use. We know for a fact that more and more people globally are using mobile phones. We know for a fact um, that more people in the global south, particularly, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, have mobile money accounts than have bank accounts. You know, and this provides us with a series of financial channels that has generated dozens of use cases, um, both in the straight delivery of cash, the delivery of smart vouchers, but also the delivery of cash in a way that has built-in components of financial inclusion. 
if we are delivering cash to people using decentralized finance mechanisms, applications, and tools available from the blockchain industry, those same tools can be used to allow people to receive cash, save cash, remit cash, <laughs> and also access things like higher levels of interest in order to build wealth in the longer term, um, microfinance, so accessing not just savings, but loans um, that are community-based. And what that gives us the opportunity to do is to enrich the units of humanitarian delivery, you know, as units of true value that lead not only to recovery from humanitarian crises, but that also lead to longer term economic recovery. Um, and in that vein, I think it's no coincidence, for example, that the majority of countries that are now central banks that are now beginning to adopt decentralized finance through building central bank digital currencies, um, per capita is much, much higher in emerging markets and emerging economies than it is in the developed world, right? And this says to us that not only can beneficiaries, you know, and populations and communities benefit from the use of this technology, but that there is a growing interest in our government partners, uh, stateside at the country level to integrate this into the way their economies operate. Um, so those are the use cases. Um, there has been, there have been use cases. There was a baby on the blockchain born in, I think it was Tanzania. Um, there are use cases also for looking at how to pre-position uh, intangible assets. So the humanitarian community, WFP in particular, prepositions goods all the time and has been doing so for decades. But, you know, with decentralized infrastructure that can house and account for digital assets, we can now begin to think about pre-positioning things like predictive cash assistance um, for delivery at the click of a button to populations who need it, um, along channels that will support economic development in the longer term uh, by crossing that digital divide and building that digital class mile. Thank you so much, Sandra. Maybe we could also turn to Sidi for her perspective on what she has seen as useful technologies in field context and in operation. There was, for instance, another comment in the chat looking at other aspects of technology, suggesting, for instance, um, um, what are the other ways that we can use these types of technology? Maybe, Cindy, over to you. Thank you very much, Yu Ping. And I have to say, I completely agree with what um, our last panelist has said, is that I think what, what's clear is that what's important is um, to, to not look at it so much from what technology is being used, it's, it's to figure out what the problem is and what people need, and then ask whether a technological solution will help solve that problem and meet, meet the needs of, uh, of that um, that community, that those beneficiaries, than a non-tech solution. And I think what the last panelist has highlighted is that, you know, with the major gaps that exist, there are so many areas and, and tools that we can help, uh, that, into which technology can help. And, you know, um, I've seen it in different ways. It's it's how we how we want to like in in a in a context like uh, Somalia. You see it in, in in a lot of different ways. I mentioned the drones. I mentioned the the work of uh, WFP in terms of really enhancing um, registration and distributions um, through through technology itself. Um, there's also when when we look at even just what I would say is localized solutions uh, with technology. Like for example. Um, there's a shortage of oxygen uh, currently within Somalia, and WHO had come come forward, you know, asking UNDP uh, interestingly, uh, for for suppliers, you know, to look at possible avenues to get oxygen into Somalia, and they through their innovative lab, they actually said, well, actually locally. You know, we have a university that's uh, that's linked up with um, it's a private university here in Mogadishu that's linked up with Zurich University, to which they've actually come up with a localized, uh, so so I would say somewhat solution to try to uh, ensure that they have these uh, oxygen concentrators uh, to support uh, the facility, at least some of the facilities here in Mogadishu, for example. So um, for me, it's it's. Um, any example and any any use that we we think of uh, with technology, it really is identifying uh, 
how it can be best used based on the need and based on the gap. And so it's tailored very much to the context. It's done in, and the last uh, speaker spoke, spoke to this uh, quite eloquently is that it's really done in partnership with local actors who understand the needs and challenges and can help with the overall community acceptance and buy-in to that. And, and that, that's also important in terms of being transparent in terms of what we want, what our goals are and what the outcomes we want from, from the use of the technology to meet again, these gaps. So for me, it's really, um, a number of factors and, and maybe just to also highlight uh, something I mentioned earlier is that is that whatever we do, we really need to look at it from the context of data responsibility and really using um, ensuring that what we do and the data protection elements of that are uh, must remain fundamental. Um, you know, um, I just want to highlight what's mentioned earlier was here in Somalia, for example, we are. Um, we are applying the interagency standing committee guidance on data responsibility because as as we continue to use more and more forms of technology and and there's this huge um what i would say is push for more data we also need to do it in, in a way that we have a framework and a guidance to which we all understand how as a system we're going to we're going to look at that and how we view data sensitivity and and the overall protection of beneficiary data that we're collecting so thank you thank you so much the next question is for john frank um there's been a couple of comments in the chat recognizing microsoft's key role in the tech field and really sort of looking forward to the partnerships that microsoft will bring in terms of working with the un and other sectors and so the question i think reflecting on the the major responsibilities and the big the, the contributions that Microsoft can actually bring to the sector is how you think tech companies generally can work more effectively across the sectors, both horizontally with the humanitarian sector and addressing a lot of these key contexts and the issues that have been raised by other speakers, as well as vertically with the local actors mentioned by Cindy and um, by Cindy and Sandra. And then conversely, how you think that, you know, for instance, the United Nations could actually work more effectively with the private sector. This is, I think, part of the coming out of our comfort zone aspect and really looking at this new area of engagement and collaboration. John? Great. Well, I think um, I've seen a tendency uh, in technology companies, including our own, to like, we're so enthused about our technology and we're so enthused, we thought of a solution and we want to come bring it to you. And it's like sometimes, you have to say, great idea, but let's let's talk about what we need and not just your idea. I mean, listen to the idea, but it's like it, it is, as, as I think both Sandra and Cindy have talked about, it is the local need that we ultimately need to be satisfying. Um, and so I think that 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 keeping the focus on the customer uh, throughout, which is the person receiving services, uh, is, is just important to, as establish a baseline for these discussions. Uh, you know, one, I think one of the things we've learned having done these is we we love what we call signature projects, you know, projects that we can point to. And I'll point to uh, the Learning Passport program that we've done with UNICEF uh, and Oxford, um, which is an online offline education uh, platform that that helps young people who are there can't go to school because of COVID but or originally designed for displaced persons and refugee children who were on the move. They could continue their curriculum. Um, they could continue. Um, they could continue learning no matter where they were. Um, and we love that program. But, you know, I think that um, companies can't just be focused on the program they love. They've got to be focused on, well, can we add something to this? And, and even if we're not going to be like, being able to say this is our project, you know, we, we need to be able to align our efforts better. I think sometimes there, there are certainly good examples of that, but I think it's too rare. Um, the last point I'll make is we've, next to last point, um, we've learned that projects need to be, they need to have sustainability built into the beginning. Um, you know, designing a program that you know, with some with some money that we put in uh, and we design, um, it's it's like the the house plant that you don't water when you go on vacation. As soon as we leave, uh, it tends to fail. And so, making sustainability one of the key 
kind of requirements of a, is there a sustainable model for this at the beginning will ensure that these projects aren't just interesting but um, but sustainable and scalable. Uh, the last thing I'd call out is um, the importance of leadership. Um, I think it's incredibly important that the Secretary General has set out um, you know, this digital transformation process at the UN and calling for data strategies. And I think it's incredibly important that Mark has, has found a valuable use case to begin working on with these predictive analytics. Um, you know, culture, you know, the culture of the employees in an organization have to have to appreciate how this isn't going to put their jobs at risk. It's going to make their jobs more impactful. And I think that that cultural transformation, it's something we have certainly are going through. Um, and I think every organization is going to be going through. And so the leadership around just that organization cultural transformation is just as important as the technology itself. Thank you, John. And I have almost run out of time, but I'm going to ask for everybody's indulgence for another three more minutes so we can really close this out this meeting and reflect on the, the comments and the really excellent remarks by our speakers. I'm going to ask all panelists to give one line on what you really were struck the most by the OCHA report in our discussion today. And then I'll close with the Under Secretary General Lowcock for a one minute takeaway on the summary of the entire event and how OCHA will take the report forward. So I'm going to go through all the panelists and ask you for one line about the discussions in the report. I'll start with Brigitte. Well, I think I, I will refer to the discussion and that, that is the tremendous experience that exists um, uh, in the field that we could much more benefit from. And I've actually uh, been multitasking by sending a mail to my colleague saying, we have to follow up with Sandra and learn more from her so that we can scale up uh, her, her good experiences. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Brigitte. And on that note, Sandra. Thank you so much, Brigitte. Uh, from my end, I guess I'd say as a key message that we need to remember that the term local in localization means working with communities and populations that struggle with crisis and adversity, and that some of the best innovation and specifically the adaptation of innovation is really born of adversity, you know, and drawing down on that desire to improve the lives of people indivi individually and their communities around them. So in that sense, I'd really encourage us as a humanitarian community, as the private sector as well, to view localization and digital innovation as an asset. You know, we're offering an opportunity to local communities, not only to make these solutions and tools more robust, but we also have an ethical responsibility and it is the core of our work to provide these communities the opportunity to begin to build these tools and products in their own image as opposed to in the image that we have decided for them um, and i think in that area of work is where we're going to see a true multiplication of innovation that is representative of local voices globally but also a diversification of the way that tech develops digital technologies and innovation um, for the sector more broadly, not just for humanitarian action. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. ASG Spatolisano. Yes, I would uh, say connectivity. Connectivity is the foundation of being able to respond effectively in humanitarian emergencies and crises. And so we must work harder to ensure universal connectivity because this fosters resilience, empowers people, and of course allows, as the SG roadmap says, uh, to prioritize you know, humanitarian action. Uh, and there is, this is a big task, not something we can do alone, someone else, the private sector can do alone. So it requires a, a multi-stakeholder co collective effort to do so. Thank you. John. Just adding that it's incredibly impressive the the projects that are going on today, and I you know the sense of acceleration that one sees um, of how technology can assist. Um, there's a lot of great work that people are doing. 
uh, in the humanitarian side and on the technology side to make sure that we're we're making progress. Um, and I commend the OCHA report for really helping um, shape the the concerns that need to be taken into account as as we develop these solutions. Thank you, John. And closing out with our OCHA colleague Cindy. Thank you very much. Uh, just to say that what I absolutely loved about the report is the balance, because uh, really what it was highlighting is is the breadth of how technology can be used, but also potentially misused. So really that focus on tailoring the solutions to the context was, was key for me. So thank you. Thank you, Cindy. And then for our final word on the Secretary General Lokalk. Well, thank you very much. I mean, it's been a great conversation. So thank you to all the panelists. Um, read the report. There's a lot more in it than we've been able to expose uh, in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much all again. And thank you everyone for tuning in and, and bearing with us the extra seven minutes. Really, it's been a pleasure moderating today. And thank you again to our panelists for a great conversation. Thank you.